Welcome to the Thundercast, your martial athletics podcast produced by the fans, for the fans, with your hosts, Russ Livingood and KD Hudnall. We're bringing you the thundering word on the thundering herd each and every week. So keep it right here. The Thundercast is on the loose. Thanks for downloading another episode of the Thundercast. You can follow us on Twitter, Thundercast underscore pod. If you wouldn't mind, click the links in the description to uh, follow us on all of our social media outlets, include some of your faves, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and of course, of course, Thundercast.online. Russ, it was a uh, kind of, I don't want to call it earth shattering, but we had some pretty major news since the last time we recorded. So I don't think there's any reason to beat around the bush. Uh, let's just get straight into it by having that, Initial first word from our sponsors at Laser Oliver PLLC. If you've been hurt in a wreck, call the law firm of Laser Oliver PLLC. Find them at 304carwreck.com. Let's get straight into this bad boy. Uh, we, we, of course, it's been a while since we recorded a show. Like I said, there's a lot going on uh, in major news wise. A lot of our teams are winding down, uh, some are just hitting the groove. But hey, give me. Five things that every herd fan needs to know this week. Well, how about six? We'll have a bonus one, but five things every herd fan needs to know this week is always brought to you by Ignite Link, the Tri State's premier IT management team. Number one, here's that big news Dan D'Antoni is out as men's basketball coach Cornelius Jackson replaces him. I'm gonna, that's cause for pause for a second because that's a even though this news is a few days old now, uh, several days old, getting we're edging closer to a week. Still, uh, a lot of fans are feeling a certain type of way, and I don't want to. Uh, by talking about it, this is not a reflection of an opinion, right? One way or another, for me, I just want to kind of talk it through because there's a lot of language that was tossed around, terms like ousted. You know, and that generally isn't a positive thing when you're hearing words like ousted. So we know that last season Dan was uh, signed to or not signed to. There were a series of three one year extensions on the table. Right. So how those conversations went down, nobody's ever going to know. Right. But the, the short and sweet of it is this. There's a head coaching change for Marshall men's basketball. I think a lot of people are uh, seeing this as a really good move. And there are a lot of people that felt that Dan was uh, should have been afforded the opportunity to leave on his own terms. And again, we'll never know how the, the situation truly played out. I will say this from the damn get-go. I am uh, immensely thankful to Dan D'Antoni, and I don't really care what this last season was like because of the fact of the matter is, some of the things that we achieved as a basketball program under him as head coach just simply had not been achieved yet. It hadn't. You're mm -hmm. talking about the first trip to the NCAA tournament in over 30 years, 31 years, the first ever NCAA tournament victory, two of the program's all-time leading scorers, and like three of the top six have come through there, several mm -hmm. other just flat-out exciting players mm -hmm. that just weren't, with Marshall long enough to be in the range of setting some all-time yeah. records. So you just can't look at one season and just be like, well, it was time. You know, it, it, it was just time. Whether that's your feeling or not doesn't change the fact of what we accomplished as a program under Dan D'Antoni. And for that, every single Herd fan, regardless of how passionate you are about Herd sports in particular, or even men's basketball, Regardless of that, you should be thankful to what uh, Dan Dan Tony did for our program. We mired in mediocrity for a long time, man. Like the whole time I was a student, there was nothing really exciting about men's basketball. We had great players, right? We had all time great players, but we weren't competing for like championships. We weren't vying for trips to the NCAA tournament. And it took Dan a few years to get there and, you know, and it takes all-time great players like John Elmore to get you over that hump. And, and of course, we were only able to do it one time. But really, that was a culmination of a lot of waiting, decades of waiting for Herd fans. So uh, before we even talk about 
Coach Jackson, which I want to do, I can't move anywhere past the tip off of this show. I didn't mean that as a pun, but the tip off of this show without saying thank you to Dan D'Antoni because, man, he he deserves all the thanks in the world for what he's provided for herd fans over the last, what is it, eight years, ten years, something like that. I mean, it's a long time. I don't know exactly, but it's a long time. Yeah, it was uh, ten years, if I remember correctly. And um, I also want to say thank you. I thought that it was an exciting brand of basketball. I felt like life was breathed back into it. I felt like the type of players that we brought in rarely did we hear any kind of issues with players i can think of one uh, uh, that had to be dismissed uh but other than that you know it was um a lot of local west virginia kids mm -hmm. uh it was uh proving that you could win with those players uh where a lot of people were saying ah oh, you know that this got to get them from here. You got to get them from there. And no, he got them from West Virginia and, uh, you know, Stevie Browning, a uh, lot of players that, that you didn't mention that were from this area uh, on top of the ones that, that you did mention. Um, Burks was, you know, the third of the top six that you mentioned. Another uh, West Virginia guy. He's from Hedgesville. West, that's what I'm saying. West Virginia kid. Uh, I also enjoyed um, how candid he was with everyone. It just seemed like he opened up the basketball program for all to see. Mm -hmm. uh, just his style. Uh, his players obviously love him. We saw those great tributes from Kenzie and from Elmore and you know, hearing others uh, pop in. I do want to say that the term forced out here's the deal. If I want to stay somewhere for one more year, but the contract's up and it's a mutual exclusive option happens in baseball all the time. You know, uh, the club has an option. The player has an option. Dan said, I want to come back. They said, we want to move on. We think it's time. That's not necessarily that they went and knocked on his door and started throwing out all this stuff and said, <laughs> Hey, you know, it's time to get out. It was a, a decision that Dan wanted to come back for another year. He had a, a one-year option contract, you know, every year. So forced out, again, it's a little harsh of a term, but it's accurate. You know, he, he did not want to leave, and they decided that they did want to move on. Um, and as we get into corny here, uh, it was not reported early, but Luke Creasy reported from the Board of Governors meeting that Corny was named as head coach in waiting. It was decided that he was named that last year. So that's why there was no uh, coach search on a national level that we've heard complaints and questions about and things like that. Uh, if he's already named the successor and it's time to move on, you know, that that's why there was no coaching search. Yeah. I want to I want to circle back to a couple of good points you made, and and uh, namely, it was the the comment you made about it felt like that the program was opened up more to fans. Yeah, and and I and I, if we go back, you know, you talk about when they hired Dan, when Dan was hired, he talked about like this was a dream job of his. He wanted yeah. to be able to come back and coach to his alma mater and take him to a new height, and he did just that. And, and to your point about rarely do you did we hear about players in trouble mm -hmm. you know that's always a, po a a point of emphasis when that type of stuff is happening in a in a particular program but then when it goes away people seem to forget about that and all they care about is winning mm -hmm. and and it's always this i'm not saying they're they're mutually exclusive it, it's mm -hmm. not like you can't win with players that stay out of trouble but mm -hmm. it's like you don't think about it until it becomes an issue and then right. you don't care about it anymore so those type of things are are things that should be noted and, and talked about. Right. So, and you talked about guys, you know, he made an emphasis on giving kids from West Virginia an opportunity to prove that they could play. Now it wasn't just anybody that could shoot a basketball. You had to have talent mm -hmm. the, and, and, and he went out and found those guys. So all things considered equal, he gave the kid from West Virginia a shot. 
because we're so vastly under recruited and, you know, and our roster stayed full of guys from the mountain state. And, and I think a lot of people appreciated that. I'm one of those. I know you're one of those because we, we are a vastly under recruited state in a lot of sports just because of population size. It's, it's yeah. hard to justify coming to see one kid when you can go down where I'm at, for example, and in, in the Tampa area and see literally hundreds of kids, you know, on a recruiting trip, uh, kind of in the same couple of counties. So, I know it's a tough situation, and there are a lot of people because the Dan Tonys have just been connected at the hip with Marshall for, <laughs> I mean, decades doesn't even accurately describe it. You know, I mean, it's 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 been a lifelong connection. Uh, so I know this is not an easy situation, and um, you're right; these type of things happen in sports all the time. But what they don't happen a lot is at our school. You know, with 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 a beloved. Uh, alum alum so now you just turn the page sadly we turn the page right you have to turn the page and you think all right well what is men's basketball going to look like in the post d'antoni era the coach jackson era because it's another similar storyline yeah great player been a coach never been a head coach which for some reason some people automatically that has to be a qualifier for some people. Well, you've never been a head coach before, so you can't be a head coach now. Well, you've got to be a head coach first somewhere, right? And that's what we have here. We have a, a guy getting his first head coaching gig, at least at the collegiate level here. Fabulous assistant coach. He was on the tournament staff with the herd. He's been with Dan for a long time. And you're right. The other thing was the, why no national coaching search? Well, that was taken care of. That that was settled a year ago or two years mm -hmm. ago, whenever those decisions were made. So that just allows uh, Marshall to have some cohesiveness within the program. Yep. And for people to say, well, you're just going to get the same old underperforming uh, herd that we had this year. A, you don't know that. You yeah. know? And B, it's just really easy for somebody to say that because it's a lot harder to have success than it is to not have success. You know what I mean? So it's an, it's a safer bet to go, well, we're just not going to be any good because being good is really hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Well, KD, uh, this is, I mean, something you'll get, not everybody on the listeners and viewers will get, but you know that I took over for someone uh, in a position that had been there for a long time, was established. I was viewed as a, a right hand or a second in command or something like that you take over and you keep the same principles and values and things, but you have a renewed energy and you come in and you do things your way that when you were there, you said, well, you know, yeah, the, the core is this, but I would tweak it here and I would tweak it there. I would do this. I would do that. That's kind of what happens in these situations. You don't get uh, someone coming in as an assistant coach for a long time in a system and coming in and doing things exactly the very same way. You know, there's there's going to be tweaks. There's going to be that. I mean, it's just the the simple fact that we're going on has nothing to do with Dan's age, but he was going to be 77. Corny is our age, yeah. you know. Uh, does that matter to some recruits? It might. You know, but it has nothing to do with Dan. Dan is one of the youngest 77 year olds as far as, <laughs> you know, behavior and style and everything that, that you're ever going to run across. Right. Um, it comes from a family that lived, you know, uh, I think his father was 102. Um, you know, it, it's it's not a knock on his age. Sometimes it's just perception, things being different and everything. A recruit uh, can can take things so many different ways. You know, Corny is probably going to be on social media a lot more. If he makes one tweet, he's going to be on a lot more than Dan, that's you fair. know? Um, it, and again, that's no knock on Dan. It's just, you can't just say things are going to be exactly the same because we're bringing in his assistant. Final word that I have to say before I throw it back to you on there is Luke also said uh, the contract details, those were previously reported that he was just going to take over Dan's existing contract. That turned out not to be true. He's got three years at $350 per year with $100,000 or $100, uh, incentives that can bump that up each year to 450000 So three-year contract. 
that's the good part because if initially the knee jerk reaction, what fans were hearing and everybody was hearing us included was that it, like you said, it was two years, what was remaining on Dan's extension. Then you're like, wow, that really sounds like a one year show me deal. And you're straight into being a quote unquote lamed up coach. If you haven't signed something in the off season. So mm -hmm. nice to know you've got that third year, mm -hmm. you know, because that gives you one year to really commit to trying to turn it around while trying to win. And then, your second year is going to have to be your payoff year in hopes of trying to get that extension without going in, into year three as a lame duck coach. Now I will say this. I, I can't say, even though we knew that, that coach Jackson was named uh, coach in waiting, I can't be mad at people and fans that were like, why did we at least not interview mm -hmm. AW Hampton? Well, I can't be mad at that, but I'll tell you, or John Brennan, right? I can't be mad at that, but I'll tell you why. Well, if you're not going to legitimately give them an opportunity to have the job, why would you potentially burn that bridge? Why would they want to accept an interview knowing your coach in waiting is on staff? So you, you don't just automatically assume every coach wants your job, right, or wants the vacancy that you have. And number two, you have to be far more tactful. I mean, dang, you know what? You, you don't just ask people to interview if you have – absolutely no intention of legitimately considering them for the position. This was coach Jackson's position. There was yeah. no need to have a search. It also allowed the herd to move quicker, mm -hmm. solidify things. Now Corny can begin to solidify his staff. If there's going to be staff turnover, any of that type of stuff, and you can get right into recruiting even harder. So I'm excited for, for coach Jackson, really excited, right? Uh, by all accounts, great dude, not even coaching wise, just a great guy. So another great person, a great man leading your program. Mm -hmm. uh, his former teammates could not be more happy for mm -hmm. him, you know, and, and those are the guys that you have to really uh, listen to when, when they give a review of somebody because they shared a locker room. They, they, they went to, you know, practices and long hours and, and games. And, you know, you really determine if you can count on somebody or not in, in a lot of those situations. So I think Marshall's got the right guy, just like Dan was the right guy for that time and place. I think with this, for this time and place, I think coach Jackson is the right guy for right now. Uh, and now of course he knows this, he doesn't need me to tell him this, but now it kind of falls on him to just seize the opportunity and yeah. win games for the herd and 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 become a contender in the uh in the Sun Belt and get back to a tournament. And I hate to do a comparison, but it's natural because we talked about this before, before we knew the news of Dan and, and Coach Jackson. Kim came in and did it in one year. Mm -hmm. Took the herd to the tournament in one year. So we know it can be done. And I think because we, we've also talked about this in relation to men's soccer and women's soccer, I felt that it puts a little pressure on women's soccer to kind of keep pace because the men's soccer program's winning so much. I kind of feel like maybe not this year, but by the second or third year of Coach Jackson's contract, if Coach Kim is still winning the way she's winning, there's going to be pressure on that basketball program to keep pace with the, what the women's team is doing. Is it unfair? Can't say if it is or not. But I just, I just think it's a natural comparison to make. But either way, you want to talk about it, whatever points you want to make, I'm extremely thankful for Dan D'Antoni. I'm extremely uh, thankful for the memories that he gave us, the star players that came through here, the opportunities that West Virginia athletes were afforded, the, the, the championship and the NCAA tournament win that we got, and, and the, the all-time program records that were set, both wins and in individual statistic categories. I wish in an ideal world he would have been able to kind of walk into the sunset on his own terms, but we just know that's not how sports works a lot. Yeah. And with all that being said, I'm equally as happy and excited for coach Jackson and look forward to the new men's basketball era under mm -hmm. Corny Jackson. Yeah. And I know I said final thoughts a minute ago, but something you brought up Corny coming in, a lot of fans have said that, uh, you know, Obina and um, uh, Nate Martin 
were the two pillars and that they hope they come back for next year two pillars of this final season what something at least to build on Mm -hmm. uh, going into next year well you would think if you draw out a coaching search and then you bring in a, a different guy in a different system those guys may bolt or they may not even wait around for the coaching search uh to end so Another thing, it's not the only reason, but it's just another piece to this puzzle. Hey, look, it's highly unusual for us to lead off with a thing and spend nearly 20 minutes, but this was huge news. Sure was. It, it dominated this uh, this news cycle uh, for our last 10 days since we recorded, so uh, it deserved it. Let's move on to number two. Uh, Tommy Schuler announces he will be inducted into the Marshall Hall of Fame 2024 class. Yeah, that was really cool because, uh, you know, we put the nomination in for Tommy, and I don't know if that meant anything, you know, because the committee is who they are, and they know who's Hall of Fame and all that kind of stuff, and they have their own process. But I thought it was really cool that fans had the opportunity to nominate people this year, and we wanted to do that. Uh, I still... There has not been a herd zone release of the full class yet. Mm-hmm. Um, we, of course, nominated three for the herd hall of fame, herd athletics hall of fame in 2024. Of course, Tommy Schuler, who announced himself that he would was going to be an inductee. Uh, we also nominated all time running back and far overdue herd hall of famer, the great Glenn Pedro, and of course, quarterback during the Tommy Schuler era and the all time leader in a myriad of herd passing categories. Rakeem Cato. Mm -hmm. So it would not shock me if uh, either one of those two remaining guys or both somehow uh, land in the article because they're both deserved. But Tommy is uh, is about as first ballot of a Hall of Fame wide receiver as you can have. And that's including a guy by the name of Randy Moss. I mean, Tommy's just in rarefied air in her wide receiving categories and all that he did and the successes that those teams had. I mean, he's an all-time great for a reason. There, it's not even a question. It's not even a like, well, he might be top four. No, he's 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 top four, you know. Um, so congratulations to him. Um, I'm a, I'm just anxiously awaiting, awaiting, honestly, the full article and the release yeah. of who all got in across the entire department. I'm assuming that will be right before the spring game. You know, you got all these yeah. former players coming in. I'm a, I'm just assuming we're two to three weeks away. Only thing that I can add to what you just said about Tommy Schuler is Tommy Schuler put up air raid receiving numbers in a non air raid system. We're bringing in the air raid this year. Can you imagine a player like him in that? If he's getting 25 targets a game instead of the 16 or 12 or what i mean guy was just a i mean he was a chain mover he was your reception guy uh mr consistent on everything and the bond that he had knowing where each other were on the same page with him and cato it was just a thing of beauty yeah sure was man and and i'll tell you what as i was researching you know i didn't want to miss any of the mind boggling stats and, mm-hmm. and career numbers and single game numbers and all that kind of stuff. And I'll tell you what I tweeted when, when he put the post out on Instagram, I tweeted that his, his resume is mind boggling. And I don't think that there are fans out there. They probably think they have a great idea of what he did, but unless you've gone down kind of line by line in the record book, like I did when I was putting together that uh, nomination, you can't begin to wrap your head around the mind boggling. Like we yeah. throw that around a lot, but it really is. Um, one of these days, maybe I'll have to post like, I, I couldn't fit it all in a Twitter post. That's, that's how big it is. You know, it was, it was, it was a unbelievable uh, resume that he has. And, and you're talking about air raid and don't forget, this is during the rockhead Johnson era when you're racking up 1800 yards on the ground. One guy is racking up 1800 yards on the ground and we had several other great running backs. So you're right, air raid numbers in a non-air raid system. That offense during that era, the Cato era, unmatched. I mean, it was unmatched. But congratulations to Tommy. Number three, I thought this was hella cool. Coach Huff named to the American Football uh, Conference Association. I, 
I'm, it's not C, is not conference. American Probably football coaches, coaches yeah, <laughs> blanking on it here, uh, to the board of trustees for the AFCA. I'd say that's a pretty good honor. You know, you've got to be um, thought of pretty highly in coaching circles to get that kind of um, accolade, that kind of opportunity to come your way. So, congratulations to Coach Huff. I mean, he's an um, uh, uh, unbelievably busy guy. And to have that type of faith in you, put in you by your peers, I think that says a lot. And I know a lot of fans um, around here, they don't really give a shit unless it's wins on the field. And I get that, right? At the end of the day, it's all about wins if you're just a football fan. But we also like to dig into the stories of people because, you know, it's it, it, as much as I want to go 13-0 and 0 every year and I don't want to go 5-7, and 7, you know, no offense, but I'm equally um, – proud of the people that we have in, in our positions of, of uh, responsibility at Marshall. I think we do a really good job of bringing in quality people. I would and, agree. and um, yeah, of course I'd love to win more. Who doesn't want to win more? Unless you're winning every game in every sport, you can always win more, but that's not the final piece of the puzzle for me. You know, ultimately it's what's going to probably decide if people have a job or don't have a job. And I get that. That's just sports. And, and, and that's also kind of the business world in general. But I can appreciate an, uh, our head coach getting an opportunity like that. I think that's, you're right, super cool. All right. Number four, we have a tight end coach that was named to – kick off uh, practice and everything, we know now that uh, we are bringing in Josh Miller from Purdue. He was yeah. up there with uh, Coach Daigie, and he was an analyst and brought in now to be our tight ends coach. Yeah, that news was out there a little while ago, and you know how it is. We've talked about this before. you got to cross the T's and dot the I's, and, and they have to wait on you know approvals and all that kind of stuff. And it just made sense to make those announcements kind of with the kickoff of spring football mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So – um, that's something that here we are 26 minutes in and we haven't even said spring football started. So uh, that's a that's, of course, a big deal. But, yeah, we, we knew that was on the horizon. Um, so you get in a little bit of familiarity Two coaches from the Boilermaker staff or an analyst and a coach coming in to the herd staff, along with several other coaches that we've talked about already. So it's definitely a new look uh, herd coaching staff in 2024. And. I'll be honest with you. I'm just waiting on some legitimate news to come out of, of uh, you know, spring ball because there's not much you can do right now. It was, it was, you know, shirts and shorts, and then, you know, they're just now starting to get into pads and stuff like that, so there's not going to be a lot of news. But it'll be a it, – it is a new-look herd coaching staff for 2024. We knew that. Uh, number five, swim and dive all Sunbelt Conference. Got a big <laughs> list for you here. First team, Molly Warner, Madeline Hart, Audrey West, Esther LeBon, Paige Banton. Second team, Maya McBride, Clava Katiyama, Grace Kelsheimer, Parker Lynch, Gabriel Ivory. And freshman of the year, Molly Warner. Yeah, kind of killed it in the pool this year. We pretty much said that all season long. And I think that these um, Sunbelt postseason awards just kind of drive that nail home, you know. Uh, I'm not saying everybody's got to be a big swim and dive fan, but you should be paying attention at least on a casual level because 10 on an all-conference team, to like first and second team, there was a third team. Marshall didn't land anybody on the third team. So everybody that we had performing – was at least a second team all Sunbelt Conference performer. And if anything says the future of the program is strong, how about bringing in freshman, freshman of, the, of year. the year? Uh, number six, I don't know if we've ever said this name on here before. <laughs> you know what's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Abby Herring decimated the school record in the outdoor 10K by shaving off one minute, 59 seconds off the old record, which she set, by the way, last year for a new time of 33 minutes, 8.7 seconds. Yeah. Nearly two minutes. 
I mean, damn. I'm, I'm sorry, 8.07 seconds. It was even lower than that. So, so <laughs> that's a huge feat. And every time we talk about a broken record with Abby, usually she's, of course, breaking her own record first. But I'm always, immediately my mind goes back to when uh, she was like, ah, do I want to come back for one more year? And then <laughs> you come back and... Marshall actually, the the uh, herd track and field Twitter account actually used my word. They used obliterated. <laughs> That's the word I love to use when describing these type of records. And she's not just breaking a record. She's, like you say, decimating, obliterating, like all of these extra adjectives, not just breaks her own record. Two, nearly two minutes, man. And I'll tell you what, if it had not been for a massively huge news cycle, in herd athletics, I know that would have been, of course, the number one thing. And I know this kind of turns into a running type of thing amongst the things, but if you keep performing the way you're performing, how are you not a thing? Like, Abby Herring is just a thing, like a, a perpetual thing on this show. We're going to have to rename it the Abby Herring Five Things Every Herd Fan Needs to Know This Week. I'm not sure that Jed and the boys would go for that right off the well, bat. Well, no, it's still brought to you by Ignite Link, but, you know, we, we just got to change the title of what they're sponsoring. Hey, I did a little thing here in uh, one minute and 59 seconds. I thought, you know, that's a long time. Go to YouTube. And you can go to Radiohead. The song is I Will. It's one minute and 59 seconds. It is <laughs> the most popular one minute and 59 second song. So she could have ran her 2023 time, popped in the old earbuds, listened to Radiohead's I Will, and she would have still finished the same time as what it was. Yeah. She could have stepped across the finish line after listening to that song and still been there. That maybe, is crazy. Maybe we should just maybe maybe we should shoot her a message and and ask her if if she would just do the voiceover for five things every herd fan needs to know this week, and we just edit that in every time <laughs> as a as a little homage to the great Abby Herring. And of course, not to be um, well, we'll, we'll probably talk about it in around the herd. So yeah. uh, I'm not, I'm not even going to get into it right then. Yeah. Well, that brings us to an end of this time. Six things every herd fan needs to know this week, as always, brought to you by Ignite Link. Tremendously, um, I guess, potential program changing things. They are changes within a program, but I don't know. These these are not going to be, um, I don't know, light, lightly received i think i think there's going to be a lot of wait and see with coach jackson whether that's justified or not mm -hmm. some people are just going to feel some type of way for a while and they may not over, they might they may never get over how the situation played out uh, i've seen some pretty rough things said on the uh social media in the social media world mm -hmm. and i want to reiterate one more time the fact of the matter is nobody except the individuals that were involved in those conversations will know how those conversations went. And for all that we as fans think we are owed that information, we are not because this is still people's lives. And, and, you know, these are private dealings. I get that they're, you know, coaches and public figures and stuff like that, but you know, they, these are still people's lives that are affected by these things. And, and they're just not, those conversations just really aren't for public consumption. All I would ask is give a guy a chance. I mean, shit, he was on staff for a reason. He was named, you know, Coach Jackson was named coach in waiting for a reason. Why don't we give him an opportunity to succeed with the herd before you just start whining and crying about why didn't we have a national search? These things were taken care of already. So let's let the plan play out. And if the plan doesn't work, then you formulate another plan. But until the time being, I'm behind Coach Jackson. I think you're – I know you're behind Coach Jackson because we just support the herd. Absolutely. I'm not I'm not pro Dan Tony or anti Dan Tony or pro Coach Jackson or anti Coach Jackson, right? That's not what it is for me. And it, even if you are, you can be both. You can be pro Dan Tony and pro Coach Jackson. It doesn't have to be these individual things. All we want is what's best for the herd, right? That's that's all it's about. So give the guy an opportunity to win before you write him off. That's that's the fair thing to do. We all want to see the herd win. So why would you want the herd to not win. It's like the football conversations we had. You you want the herd to lose so you can be right, 
or do you just want the herd to win? You might have to be wrong, but the herd will win. So I choose to be wrong and let the herd win. If that's, if that's what it is, I have no problem doing that. Agree with that. All right. We're going to move on and take it around the herd. We're going to start off with football. As we mentioned, the spring practice has begun. Practices are closed. So you're not going to see a whole bunch of stuff out there. News wise, like you said, uh, there will be one practice coming up that is open to season ticket holders that they emailed out before season practice began. Uh, so you'll see a little bit of news coming out when that happens. Um, I think that might be this Saturday that's coming up. Hmm. Uh, also, that means the spring game is coming up. Keep in mind, landscaping by Hillcrest has made it possible that me, you, and all of our friends are going to have an epic, epic tailgate. And uh, we're bringing in our friends, the Kentucky Mash Boys, and having a huge tailgate out there on April the 20th. More details to come every time that we have a show. We're going to talk about it leading up to that. But thank yeah. you, Landscaping by Hillcrest. Go to landscapingbyhillcrest.com. Find them on Facebook. You will not believe the type of stuff they do. We're not talking about mowing grass. We're talking about hardscapes, patios, fences, major yard transformations. Give them a follow. Yeah. Uh, also, football news picked up a transfer from Central Michigan offensive lineman Aiden DeCourt. Yep, uh, saw that. He was a freshman on the 2023 roster, did not appear in any games for uh, Central Michigan last year. So it doesn't say, I'm just speculating, probably going to use that red shirt year, going to be a red shirt freshman, I would imagine, for the herd mm-hmm. this year. He doesn't have to, could come in as a true sophomore and, and wait to utilize that red shirt year later down in his career you never know too uh because we don't know everything about every transfer he could have had an injury and got a medical red shirt yeah. and then they would have five years here to play for so you just you just don't know but anyway yeah. listed on the roster last year as a freshman six foot 300 pounds uh they listed him as i think offensive lineman and slash long snapper so a versatile guy to maybe contribute on special teams as well mm-hmm. uh, we already know that we have our long snapper in-house already but never really hurts to have another guy or two that can handle that if you have an injury or something else happens but uh welcome to the herd Aiden DeCourt moving on over to tennis they are rolling in the Sun Belt Conference as they picked up wins at Arkansas State five to two and Louisiana Monroe seven to nothing and then at home against Texas State seven to nothing and Louisiana Four to nothing. So three straight shutouts, four straight victories over the past two weekends since we have recorded. That is six wins in a row overall in the Sun Belt Conference with their lone loss coming against Old Dominion, which was the first uh, Sun Belt Conference matchup that they had. That puts them with a uh, six and one Sun Belt Conference record just behind Old Dominion, who is at six and zero, oh, and as we said, gave them their only loss. They travel to South Alabama this Saturday and then Southern Miss on Sunday. Um, I told you so. (laughs) That's what I'm going to say to that. Uh, I told you. This tennis team was rolling. They would probably come down. It would probably come down to matches between Old Dominion, James Madison, and Marshall to see who would end up at the top and what order they would finish in the top three. So far, that's holding true because nobody's holding a candle to the herd since that match with Old Dominion. If they can keep it up and make it to and through James Madison, uh, the Herd's probably going to be looking at a strong second-place finish because, of course, Old Dominion would have to drop two in order to have the Herd overtake them. Uh, And then you're really just fighting for seeding in the Sun Belt Tournament for all the marbles, really. But I got to say, I don't do this often, but I did tell you also, the Herd tennis team is hot. Yeah, and we talked about that. They had a rough schedule out of conference coming in, uh, and at the very end, I said, don't let this get you down because they are losing to some power teams here right before Mm -hmm. they go in, and all it's going to do is make them better. Then they kicked it off with an unfortunate schedule of having to face the best right off the bat in Old Dominion, but they are absolutely killing it right now, and uh, hopefully a couple more wins this week, and 
You never know what could happen. Old Dominion loses one, then all they have to do the rest of the year, lose another one, we could slide into that. Good. All right, track and field. Uh, picked up a commitment from Caden Bowen. And let's talk about the Raleigh relays. Evan White was one second off the school record in the 10K. We mentioned Abby Herring's record in the 10K uh, earlier on five things every heard fan needs to know this week. Kylie Maston set the high mark in the Sunbelt Conference in the 1500 meter with a time of four minutes, 25.43 seconds. I do have to say that uh, Herring's record was also the high water mark for uh, the Sunbelt Conference. So we've got two leading the conference as it stands right now. Others set a bunch of personal bests and times that would place for scoring in the Sunbelt Conference championships if they were to keep those times. So go to that article if you want to see. You had uh, uh, Rebecca Merritt doing some good things, Evan White doing some good things, and then some other people coming in setting personal records. A uh, lot in that article on the Raleigh Relays on there. Uh, they got split squad action coming up uh, this week. Some will be at the Golden Eagle Invitational at the University of Charleston right down the road, while others are heading to Tampa down in your neck of the woods oh. on Friday and Saturday for the South Florida Invitational. As they be back at – they did that last year, right? They were at USF, and I was unable to go, I think, because I don't know why. I, 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 surely I had to work, but they're going to be – If I remember correctly, there was a car issue last year. Oh, maybe that's what it was. But I do remember seeing pictures of that. There was a pretty good contingency of Hurt yeah. fans down yeah. there. Yeah. So, cool. Maybe I'll have to um, see about checking that out this year if they're going to be – see where they're going to be and – how far away it is from the house. One more note. Uh, you mentioned the uh, commitment of Mr. Bowen. Second commitment a few days later from uh, Dakota Dammeyer from Fairmont. Looks like he is a shot putter. So two this week for the herd. And the, uh, the recruiting is just continuing to stay high. I think this is like, it feels like about four straight weeks of, uh, commitments to the herd track and field program so yep. we must be doing something right because they they are on a roll with recruiting and of course the in-state kids is, is a lot of them and of course we're also getting some kids down from our neck of the woods so or my neck of the woods not ours you're up there i'm down here um so i i, I love it i love it i don't maybe it's because the the these uh other athletic programs like track and field are being more active on social media but these were just harder to find last year and, yeah. and since we started doing this. So I'm really glad they're doing that, man. It helps us keep our listeners uh, closer to these programs, you know? So it, two this week is a pretty, pretty, pretty good way to keep it rolling. And not to mention, uh, it's not going to be a press release if some of these uh, football players that are coming in are also going to run track. You know, that's something that we'll find out much later. So could have a lot more on that men's track team, especially for sprinting and those type of events. So, yeah, onward and upward. Uh, volleyball, they landed an unnamed commitment last week, but they did put that out that they grew again. And the way mm -hmm. that it has worked in the past couple of weeks, they throw that out there and then the name gets released, you know, a week or so later. So I got a feeling that we'll have a name for you next week. They uh, had a couple of exhibitions at home this weekend against Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia State. And typically, unless someone was there and tweets us or lets us know, we're not going to be able to get info on that. Same with soccer. On these exhibition matches, they really don't put out a box score or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, they traveled to Wright State for an exhibition match this Saturday. Men's and women's golf are both currently at Pauley's Island, South Carolina, in the Golf Week Invitational. Um, that is going on Monday through Wednesday. Tyler Jones leads Marshall men through round one, and Kylie Bowes leads Marshall women. Nice. Yep. I saw that we had a couple of under par rounds there and, and some strong starts, so... Well, it was a par, or maybe even, a maybe even a par. Under par. Maybe it was an under par back nine or something like that. Yeah. to draw to even par. Yeah, I saw. yeah, it was an even par for Tyler at seventy two, and Kylie is uh, leading Marshall with a uh, five over seventy seven in the first round. Cool. Uh, baseball back on three twenty three and three twenty four. Keep in mind, we 
recorded late Friday on the 22nd. So that series against Arkansas State, uh, Heard won the second game. That gave them the series win. Dropped the final game 6-4 to four in 14 innings. Hell of a game. We came back at the end, forced uh, forced it into extras, but uh, could not come away with the victory. Then we had a loss at Virginia Tech on Tuesday, 4-2. to two. And we traveled to App State this past weekend, and there was an offensive explosion. That's the good news. Bad news is we came out second in that offensive explosion. They had a lot more offense. We picked up a win in the home opener, or the opener, not the home opener, nine to eight before dropping the next two games, fifteen to ten in a slugfest, and then nineteen to two in seven innings. It was fifteen to nothing after three in that game. Yeah. Whew. Whew. I don't know. Whew. That's all you got to do. <laughs> Man, not ideal. But yeah. hey, you, you you take your victories when you can. And you say, you know what? We got the, kind of the snot beat out of us in the in the finale. It just got steadily worse for the herd, you know, offensively. Like did okay, went toe-to-toe, but dropped one and then fell off a cliff and just kind of got beat down in the series finale, but did not get swept. And that's – I'll take that. Well, um, the other thing too, and I say this a lot, but – when they register it in the loss column or the win column, they don't actually score it on how much you won by or how much you lost by. A loss is a loss the same way that we lost 15 to 10. The 19 to 2 is the same way. Yeah, right. You just move on and go to the next one. Uh, they were to host Virginia Tech on Tuesday at 6 p.m. That game has been postponed due to the weather. We have tornadoes coming through Huntington. Um not sure when that's going to be scheduled to. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they will be hosting Texas State, 6 p.m., 3 p.m., and noon. Softball, rough stretch. Lost five in a row since we recorded. Southern Miss took the final two games of that series back on March 23rd, March 24th, as we said. Uh, those were 6-3 loss and an 8-5 loss. And then they got swept by U, uh, ULM this past weekend, sixteen to eight in six innings, three to one and four to nothing. Uh, Tuesday game has already been canceled due to that weather that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And then they traveled to Atlanta this weekend for a series with Georgia State. Those times are five p.m., one p.m., and eleven a.m. on Sunday. Yeah, a little bit of growing pains for Coach Zirkle. We're a 500 team now after we've hit this little five-game skid. Uh, but, yeah, it's hard to, you know, put a put a super positive spin on a five-game losing streak, especially coming off of a program setting season for wins. But, you know, we talked about this with Morgan and how late in the game all of this happened for her, and she was, like, really behind the eight ball as far as, you know, recruiting and, and portal and, if you look at what she was able to do and who she was able to get in the time that we had, those are some of the players that are performing really, really well for the herd. Mm-hmm. Bella Gerlock is killing it. Kasia Parks continues to be a perpetual web gem out there yeah. in center field. I mean, she is fun to watch. I know you them. enjoy that. You've Love talked that. about that before. Love that. Um, Brooklyn Ulrich, for all intents and purposes, has – caught freaking fire you know uh two home run day the other day including a grand slam second grand slam of the year yeah i saw that she become only the second herd softball player ever to record multiple grand slams in a season so there's a lot of individual good going and there are other players that are doing really well i'm not just trying to say it's just those three people Mm -hmm. but off the top of your head you know bub fringa still continues to do really well in the circle savannah rice is doing really well in the circle it's just uh we've talked about man we lost so much from the roster last year to this year it was going to be hard to replace those that were exhausting eligibility Mm -hmm. and then those that just chose to also hit the portal some great young players that's just a big hole to fill i'm not trying to cast any blame but this is a these are real problems that you have yeah. to try to find solutions for. And, and just to add context to that, I don't know if anybody's paying attention, but um, you know, I I still keep tag. I'd like I like to know how Megan and Corey are doing down in, in at Carolina, right? Mm-hmm. Because they were good to us and 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 you want to see good people do well. So 
Um, they're doing really well down there, but I say that to say this, you know, we had a freshman last year by the name of Alex Coleman. She played right field. She was lead off hitter for us. She did nothing but get on base and, and steal bases and score runs all season long. The last I saw this was sometime last week, she was like second in the country on, in, in, in on base percentage. So think about that. If that weapon was still here with the herd and you've, and you've got a, a, a perpetual base runner all the time. You know, and and we talked about Automo and leaving, and and she led the team in home runs and set an RBI record. Dude, these are legitimate offensive, like, uh, questions that had to be answered, and the herd is trying their best to do that. But that's a lot of production that is no longer in Kelly Green and White. And that's all offense that you talked about. All offense. And look at losing Sid Nestor, who pitched. I mean, what was it, ninety four percent or something of our innings last year? Ninety it's at a lot. least. It's a lot. Yeah. But that was a that was an exhaustion of eligibility situation. Those two were transfers I was talking about because they yeah. had the opportunity to come back and didn't. Uh, but yeah, if Sid was had one more year, holy moly, you know this yeah. would probably also. And again, no knock on Bub, no knock on Savannah, no knock mm -hmm. on anybody that also pitches for the herd in in spots. But you can't tell me that if uh, if Sid didn't have one more year of eligibility, this wouldn't be a different that, that we wouldn't have a different record because yeah. we would we would she was and, dominant and just speaking off the cuff here you know i think everyone coaches players fans parents uh, us everyone recognized that pitching was going to be one of the weaknesses this year and i feel like bub faringa has overperformed from sure. expectations and uh, i don't think anyone has done bad it's just the the point that we knew that was not going to be what was a strong point last year, defense and pitching, that the pitching this year was going to have a fall off. But I think Bub yeah. has done an amazing job, not to mention she does it behind the plate. I mean, at the plate as well. That's right. Yeah. No, there's by no indication trying to say that we are underperforming in the circle. It's just when you lose somebody as dominant and as great as Sidney, there's going to be a fall off. Yeah. It's be, be, even the players that we Bub and and Savannah both got better, but there's still an overall pitching drop off. Yeah, and, and that's that they're doing great, you know. But those those dominant pitchers, those power command pitchers, just don't grow on trees, you know. So um, I've got I've still got complete faith in in what we're doing. Obviously, I mean, why wouldn't you? You know, Morgan and her staff haven't even had an opportunity of a full recruiting cycle. I mean, gracious sakes, wait till, you know, uh, there, we're, we're on a little losing streak. We're going to, there's just as easily a winning streak around the corner, you know, and then just wait. I'm not trying to close the season down, but I'm just saying, let her get an opportunity to get a, a full portal window or two, get a full recruiting cycle or two. There's some young talent that's already committed. You know, they're very active on our social media timelines. They're excited about coming to play for the herd. They're excited about playing for uh, this this coaching staff. You know, we, we knew it was not going to be an instantaneous, you know, uh, line of success. We knew it. So we're seeing it. Uh, but I, these girls still fight tooth and nail. You know, they ain't going away. Uh, that's what we love about this team on top of the fact that they just are fun to watch and have a really good time doing it. And, um, you know, they're still really, really good. They're just, their record is just, you know, that we plus, by the way, we played a immensely harder schedule this year than we did last year. You know, that, that non-conference schedule was exponentially harder than it was last year. So we expected there would be more losses this year than last well, that does it for Around the Herd as well. I have a little something uh, for my thoughts at the end, then I'll kick it back over to you. And if you don't have anything, I'll take us out of here. But uh, if I could get everyone that is on Twitter or Facebook to go and look up the Southside Suite under Twitter, it's at Southside Suite, S-U-I-T-E. That is an apartment that I have for... Uh, it's going up on Airbnb, but if any herd parents or fans from out of town, out of state, are looking to come in for sporting events, I'd sure appreciate the opportunity for you to look at my place. KD, you've been there before. Uh, it has had a major facelift, though, over the past week or so. Uh, one of the reasons that we haven't recorded in that past week. But you can find it on Facebook. You can find it on Twitter. 
or if not, just message me and I'll give you all the details. Yeah, uh, I've, I have stayed there, you know, on, on a couple of my trips back to Huntington for games and events and things. And um, it's it's um, quiet enough because it's in the middle of the south side of where Russ and them live. So you're not downtown. If you want to be downtown, then that's a different, you know, that's a different factor. But it's a nice little place to stay. It's quiet. It's roomy. You know, you got the upstairs and downstairs. You can stretch out a little bit. You're not going to be on top of one another. So um, check it out. Southside Suite at, at Southside Suite. Uh, no, the only thing I really have is uh, we've hinted at, hinted at this several times about a uh, podcasting network that we are a part of. Uh, we are the Marshall Athletics unofficial right because this is we're not officially tied to marshall athletics but we are the marshall representatives for the college huddle podcasting network and uh we're about two weeks away depending on when someone listens to this episode of the official launch of the college huddle um we're really thrilled to be a part of it we're really thrilled to be the ones that were asked to represent the herd because for russ and i that is confirmation that we're doing things uh, that people like, that we're doing, uh, providing the content that people want to listen to and people want to watch. So we are thankful to those guys for uh, extending us the invite. And uh, it's going to be big. You know, this isn't just a, oh, we're in a club type thing. There, there's, It's going to be easier for you to... Uh, follow along the teams we may be playing. It's going to be easier to, for you to get insight during game week. There's going to be um, certain types of national shows that we may be contributing to or asked to contribute to uh, with uh, during our duration with the, the college huddle. I just posted a commercial, a teaser for it earlier, and uh, I'll be making the rounds on the remainder of our social media outlets throughout the day. So, be on the lookout here in about two weeks, depending on when you listen to this episode, because we'll be providing the links to everything uh, when it officially launches. So all I can say is be on the lookout because you know that Russ and I were not going to allow the herd to not have a seat at this table. The realignment era in college sports podcasting is underway and we ain't getting left out. So stay tuned. Uh, it's going to be cool. All right, I'm going to take us out of here. Whether you see us at the Jack, whether you see us at the Dot, or whether you see us at College Huddle, bringing you all this content that we always do, no matter where you see us, we're going to be saying, Go Hurt. Go Hurt, it's the Thundercast. We will see you next week. Later. Later.